Hey, where are you going? Don't do it, don't do it. Hi, it's your host Kay, and welcome back to Marvelous Videos. Today, David Cronenberg and William S. Burroughs invite you to lunch. Naked Lunch 1991 Explained. Let us have a little lunch time together today. After all, it is there to be the most important meal of the day, right? But keep this in mind that this will not be an ordinary lunch visit. Because for today's video, we have a very special fun and scary invite. Hey guys, welcome back to another horror movie video with Marvelous Videos. Get ready to keep your eyes hooked to your iPads, laptop screens, or mobiles, wherever you're watching this from. We bring to you the horror movie of the day, which is Naked Lunch, released in 1991. This has to be the most perfect match of a director and artist of the story. William Burroughs is one of the most important figures of the Beat Generation, who published a novel, Naked Lunch, in 1959. You're probably thinking, why would they make a movie after so many years about this novel, right? Well, you'll soon find that out for yourself. Canadian director David Cronenberg directed the film adaptation of Naked Lunch, and he did so with great pleasure because his favourite writer has always been Burroughs. Ever since the early 1980s, Cronenberg wanted to make an adaptation of Naked Lunch. In order to make it happen, in 1985 he even travelled to Tangiers, the novel site and inspiration, with Burroughs and producer Jeremy Thomas. Then, finally, after the release of Dead Ringers, he was able to gather enough funds for his passion project. The film stars Peter Weller, Judy Davis, Ian Holm, and Roy Scheider. It's a surrealist science fiction drama with an international co-production of Canada, Britain, and Japan. It was released by 20th Century Fox, which later became a cult film. It also received many great honours, including the National Society of Film Critics Award for Best Director, amongst others. Well guys, let us get into exploring what kind of a lunch invitation exactly is this film. It sure sounds pretty daring. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, and let's begin. Back these days, we'll contact you there. The book was banned, the film should never have been made too late. Naked Lunch 1991. You're about to enter a world that you definitely have never seen before. It will have you questioning what's real and what is unreal at several stages throughout the film. But be reminded that this is absolutely out of the ordinary. The narrative, the adaptation, plot, and the way the film proceeds, you're going to be stunned even if you've not read the book. Peter Weller plays the main character in this film, William Lee, who's a pest exterminator. In the beginning of the film, it looks like our exterminator seems to have run out of his supply of roach powder. William suspects that it's being stolen by somebody. Well, it's not too late until he goes home and discovers who it is. Joan Lee, his wife, who's played by Judy Davis, is actually the one who's been injecting this insecticide into her body as a drug to get herself high. That definitely is a classic case of certain drugs gone missing. He's soon arrested by the police, and when he tells them that the supposed drugs are in his possession, and they are for his job, they were conducting tests on a giant beetle. Up until now, everything seems pretty simple and normal, but things are about to change in the movie. The giant beetle starts talking to William and tells him that apparently William is a secret agent who works for him. The talking beetle then tells Lee that his wife is not actually his wife. She is apparently an agent for an organization called Interzone Incorporated, which is a free port on the North African coast. He then orders Lee to kill Joan and asks him to submit a report of the assassination after the job is done. He gets furious with all this and ends up killing the beetle. Later, back at home, Lee finds his wife having sex with one of his writer friends, Hank. He appears pretty okay about it for some reason. Things are definitely very bizarre in this moment. Lee then tries to do a customary William Tell routine with his wife and accidentally ends up shooting a bullet right in the middle of her head. That sure is a tragic way to die. We can sure say that Lee has definitely been exposed to the insecticide drug, and the conversation with the beetle was a hallucination. He once again starts seeing things, and because now the police are looking for him, for the murder of Joan Lee, he decides to run away to Interzone with a new Clark Nova typewriter that he purchased to write his supposed report. This place is apparently somewhere in a city in North Africa. It looks like Lee is addicted to another weird drug that leaves marks on his hand, and he soon finds out that his typewriter has now turned into a talking beetle. Yet another new one. The movie just keeps getting more and more interesting. 
you will now be surprised to see the return of the dead. Lee spots a girl who looks exactly like his wife and apparently her name is Joan Frost and her husband is Tom, played by Ian Holm. Don't worry, she is of course not back from the dead. This girl is Joan Lee's doppelganger. Now his typewriter turned insect gives him the order to seduce Joan Frost to find out what the subject of her report is. We then meet Frost's housekeeper, Fidela, who also it seems sells some kind of a sea creature in the market. It looks like Joan might be sexually involved with Fidela, but is unsure if all of this is a part of Lee's hallucination. Lee now finds out a lot of surprising things about his dead wife. Apparently, she was sent by Fidela, who is one of the controllers at Interzone, to marry Lee. And in fact, the insect tells Lee that Joan wasn't even human. She was a special corpse centipede. This is all shaping out to be pretty damn insane, right? Well, we now find out the person who is behind Interzone Incorporated, Dr. Benway. This man is running a double operation, it seems, and his cover is through selling a rare kind of a black meat, which is made from the flesh of a giant aquatic Brazilian centipede. If you're thinking this movie is all about giant beetles, insects, and centipedes, then you're exactly right. Now, remember the suspicious housekeeper, Fidela? Well, as it turns out, Fidela actually is Dr. Benway, a man in the suit of a woman disguising everybody. Lee and Dr. Benway at last have an encounter where we find out that it was Dr. Benway himself who secretly recruited Lee without his knowledge at all. It looks like he's expanding his business now, and he sent Lee to a place called Anexia with Joan. At the Anexian Border Patrol, Lee tells them that he's a writer. Naturally, they ask him to prove it, and now it feels like we have a flashback. Lee immediately tells Joan to do their William Tell routine. She puts an empty glass on her head, and once again, Lee misses the shot and ends up killing this doppelganger Joan as well. The film ends with Lee in weepy eyes being accepted into Anexia. Well, this film sure knew how to leave the audience in absolute terror and strangeness. We're sure you have tons and tons of questions right now. Don't worry, let us dig deeper into this video to find out all of the strange behavior of William Lee. What's up? Blank faced bug killer and mutating Mediterranean city, a hallucinatory existence. You won't be surprised after knowing the story of the movie that there was a time when people didn't expect that the novel could ever be made into a movie. Well, with the genius of Cronenberg, we get to watch this fantastic story right in front of us on the screen. Even then, the film is a little different from the novel itself, but it is primarily based on it and shares a lot of similarities from the original story. Remember the place where Lee thinks that he's gone? After the death of his wife, the fictional North African region of Interzone, well, it's basically a hallucinogenic version of Tangiers. The story is based on the real life of William Burroughs more than you can ever imagine. In fact, the whole part of Lee accidentally killing his wife in a William Tell routine has been taken directly from the real events that happened with William Burroughs. Just like Lee, Burroughs was in fact an exterminator and drug addict who accidentally shot his wife during a drunken game of William Tell. Joan Lee is based on his actual deceased wife, Joan Volmer, and even Lee's writer friends, Hank and Martin, are based on the well-known Beat Generation poets, Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg. Burroughs moved to a section of Tangier, Morocco, known as International Zone, and that is where our very own place of Interzone in the film actually comes from. Towards the end of the film, Lee is seen having a sexual relationship with a guy named Kiki. This also happened with Burroughs who had a same-sex affair in Tangier with a young man named Kiki while he was writing Naked Lunch. The desert that is shot in the film was completely recreated on a Toronto soundstage by pouring 700 tonnes of sand onto the floor of a former munitions factory. The film cinematography definitely reflected the effort done by everyone. Lee ended up driving himself to a state of drug addiction after he accidentally killed his wife, and that's how he went on to write a story without ever realising that he's written it. The whole time, according to Lee, he was living in this bizarre town with all sorts of creatures. We have a part in the film where he's visited by his friends Hank and Martin. That's when we realise that in his hallucinatory state, all the reports that Lee has been writing is in reality a novel called Naked Lunch, and not the reports for Interzone. Interzone is a place that Lee hallucinates, and so is everything that happens there. There are typewrites that have apparently turned into creatures in this place. Lee thinks that they are there to guide him, and they're giving him orders which he needs to follow. Clark Nova, which is Lee's typewriter, is the first creature who looks like a giant beetle, with letters engraved which help Lee to write. 
All the creature scenes in the film surely look gruesome and gooey. There is a lot of blood sprouting out when a typewriter is killed and also a strange white liquid that Lee is seen drinking. The second creature is a Martinelli typewriter which belonged to Tom Frost. It's apparently killed by Lee's typewriter which definitely looks like the murder of their kind. Tom takes away Clark Nova from Lee as revenge. Lee is then seen roaming around with a bag that according to him has broken pieces of a typewriter. This is when we're reminded that all of this is probably not real. Hank and Martin come to check up on Lee and when he shows in the bag, it's visible that there are all kinds of drugs and pills and injections inside, which of course is the reality. Now comes our third creature who is also seen a lot in the film which is called the Mugwumps. Interzone also has a place where every broken thing can be fixed. That's where Kiki helps Lee to get a new typewriter from, which pretty much looks like the head of a mugwump. These are actually beaked creatures of black bone with thin and sleek body structure. They have long black tongs, no liver, thin purple blue lips, and they feed on sweets and secrete an odd liquid from a weird body part on their heads. We are introduced to this creature by Kiki, and as surprising as it may be, even Kiki had a very gruesome death. Lee met a gay Swiss gentleman named Yves Cloquet, who turned out to be a creature himself. When Kiki and Lee visited him at his house, he seduced Kiki, and we saw that his body had transformed into a centipede, and he poked Kiki all over and killed him. Before we find out the actual real identity of Dr. Bemway, we see that this man has been operating from a place which is apparently full of mugwumps. There are also people who seem to be drinking that strange white liquid which pours out of an antenna like rod coming out of the mugwump's head. The place that the film ends with, Anexia, also looks like it's a place from Lee's hallucination because there's no chance that it could be real. Lee probably cries at the end because after Joan Frost's death, it finally hits him that he went down the road of drug addiction after his wife's death and nothing has been great ever since. This stuff is very potent. The two are very closely related. Why should you watch Naked Lunch? Well, Naked Lunch sure ended up being quite a traumatizing movie with a pretty sad ending if you look at William Lee. But we can say that everything that happened with him is what led towards this thrilling movie to come out in such a scary and terrifying way. It's a fantastic film with an amazing cast. The movie couldn't be filmed in Tangiers because of the war in Iraq, which is why it was shot in Toronto. As a result of that, some translite panes were used to represent the exotic backgrounds which were seen through the windows. Translite panes are basically large translucent enlargements of a photo. Also, if you're wondering about what happened with William Burroughs after he actually killed his wife, well, as per the Mexican laws in the period at that time, he did end up doing 13 days of jail time. So what are you waiting for? Make sure to check out this movie because you probably won't be getting any more bug powder movies anytime soon. And with that, we have come to the end of another awesome video. We hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it for you. Make sure to drop a like and hit the subscribe button on your way out. And also tell us in the comments down below which creature design from this movie did you like the most. Until then everyone, stay safe, take care, and see you in the next video. Have a great day.